Welcome and thank you all for uh, being here tonight for the Andrea Mitchell Center's Race and Politics Series event, The Party of Lincoln? Question mark, a post-election conversation with Tara Set Mayer and Roger Smith. I would like to thank our panelists in advance for what I'm sure is going to be a very exciting discussion, as well as the Andrea Mitchell Center for hosting and to the Black Graduate and Professional Student Assembly, BGAPSA, for co-sponsoring this event. I am a graduate fellow in the Andrea Mitchell Center and a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science here at Penn, and I'm thrilled to be moderating this discussion tonight. I also want to recognize my fellow AMC fellows, Drew Starling and Ashani Dasgupta, as well as Joanna Ferguson from BGAPSA, who you can't see right now, but who have been instrumental in planning tonight's event. So before I introduce our panelists and start our conversation, uh, I would just like to give a couple of pieces of logistical information. First, we're going to have plenty of time this evening for audience questions. So during the conversation between Tara and Rogers, please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you, if you haven't used that before, uh, down in the bottom bar of the screen, you'll see a Q&A button. If you click on that, you'll be able to submit your questions that way, and we, the moderators, will be able to, to view them. We're hoping to have lots of time to make it through all, um, many of the questions that come in. Uh, you can also use the Q&A function if you have any logistical or technical issues. Again, I can't promise I'm going to be able to help you solve them, but we'll do our very best. And the last thing, uh, our event this evening is being recorded and will be posted on the Andrea Mitchell Center website. So please check back for that in the coming days. So we are now just two weeks, a little over two weeks out from the 2020 election. And while most of the ballots have been counted and the outcome of the presidential election is relatively clear, if not certified yet, we have only begun to explore the implications of this election for American democracy. We are truly a country divided. Tonight, we won't try to take on all of the issues that this election has raised, but we will take on a few. And most centrally tonight, we will be thinking about what this election means for the future of the party of Lincoln, the grand old party, the Republican party. I'm delighted to now introduce our guests for this evening who are both extremely well positioned to speak to this topic. Tara Set Mayer is a CNN political commentator and ABC News contributor and senior advisor for the Lincoln Project, which is a bipartisan coalition built in opposition to Donald Trump. She's also the host of the podcast, Honestly Speaking with Tara. Tara focuses her tell it like it is commentary and analysis on political issues that impact America's future. She's a former GOP communications director on Capitol Hill and a 2020 uh, spring 2020 Harvard Institute of Politics resident fellow focusing on principle versus party, the importance of speaking truth to power in a time of universal deceit. This is the second event that we've been very happy to welcome uh, Tara to this, this fall at the Andre Mitchell Center, and we're delighted to have her back. Also joining us this evening is Roger Smith, uh, the Christopher H. Brown Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the author of an intimidating number of books and articles. Most recently, uh, this year, he published That Is Not Who We Are, Populism and Peoplehood. His research center is on constitutional law, American political thought, and modern legal and political theory, with special interests in questions of citizenship, race, ethnicity, and gender. Professor Smith was the president of the American Political Science Association for 2018 to 2019, and he's also the creator and former director of the Andrea Mitchell Center uh, under a different uh, previous name which means that he's a frequent and generous participant in the center's events. I believe this is also the third or fourth post-election event he's participated in at, at Penn, uh, so which means that both Tara and Rogers have been making the rounds uh, discussing the implications of this election. So without further ado, I'd like to once again remind you that the Q&A is open, so please feel free to submit those questions. I'm going to turn things over to Rogers and I will be back uh, for the audience Q&A, so thank you. Thank you, Katie, and thanks to the Andrea Mitchell Center and all the sponsors, everyone uh, who's Zoomed in. And thank you, Tara, for uh, joining us. It's a privilege to have you back with the Andrea Mitchell Center. Um, I wanted to start by uh, saying that uh, 
Uh, you and I are of different generations. We obviously have other differences, but we also have one thing in common uh, that you might not expect. Uh, both of us uh, worked for the Republican Party and decided to leave the Republican Party. Um, except that I did it 50 years ago uh, when I was completing, just after I completed my term as state chairman of the Illinois Teenage Republican Federation. And I uh, left the Republican Party in Illinois then uh, because I saw myself as an Abraham Lincoln Republican. And there was in the state then uh, a new brand of conservatives that I saw as hostile to civil rights. And they were taking over the party, so I moved on. Now, uh, you um, uh, joined the party much, much later, and uh, uh, you bring a far more contemporary perspective that I think it'll be helpful for us to understand. So maybe we could start with you explaining uh, what were the commitments that led you to become a Republican, and why did you recently decide to leave? Well, um, talk about starting off with the easy question, right? Um, but thank you so much for having me and thank you again to the Andrea Mitchell Center and you Penn for bringing me back. Uh, this has been an unbelievable time in politics to be discussing these issues. So it's an honor and privilege for me to be able to do it with you guys. Um, so, you know, what attracted me to the, to the Republican Party um, was, is very different from what the Republican Party looks like today, which is why I decided I've had enough. But, um, you know, the history of the party and uh, being the party of Lincoln and what Lincoln stood for, um, you know, as far as equal protection under the law and the importance of, of freeing slaves and uh, the ills, you know, what he referred to as the um, ill omen uh, among us, which he warned about back in the 1830s, way before even the Civil War. And uh, that was, you know, the idea of the of the importance of protecting all the equality of humanity, uh, regardless of of race, was something that I was attracted to. That made sense to me. Um, I'm biracial, so you know, the idea of being pigeonholed or restricted from opportunities in America because I'm a woman or a woman of color uh, was something that my mom made sure that I never felt a victim of, and. Um, I saw the the opportunity, like what um, Jack Kemp, who was very influential in my conservative journey, uh, who was the Health and Human Services Director under George H. W. Bush. Jack Kemp always preached the importance of providing ladders of opportunity. Right? We can't guarantee outcomes, but the idea is to present an equal opportunity to those to those uh, ladders of opportunity, and to live it and walk it. And uh, that resonated with me because um, my mom had me at 21. She was a single parent. And so my mom, no one, my mom never took a handout and taught me never to be a victim. So the idea of making your own way in, in the greatest country in the world, despite her flaws, um, was very appealing to my mom and to me. That's how she taught me to um, approach life. So you know, the ideas of the, the individualism of conservatism and, and um, you know, smaller government and, you know, not being a victim of your circumstance was really the foundation for, uh, for my conservative values. And then obviously, as I got older, the Republican Party was the, the vehicle by which you express your political power. And so when I was in high school, that was around, uh, let's see, 92 was George H.W. Bush's reelection. And uh, that's when I formally got involved with Republican Party activities. And I chose to go to George Washington University in Washington, DC, so I could be in the epicenter of, of political power. I was fascinated with Washington. I came to DC um, on a school trip in eighth grade and just was enamored with all of it, uh, with the halls of Congress and the Supreme Court and just seeing living history there and knowing that this is where so many decisions are made that impact people's lives that it was something I wanted to be a part of. So, um, you know, ending up in Washington to go to college and basically staying, never leaving, <laughs> um, was, uh, I guess, divine uh, providence for me. But the idea of, of being a part of making the laws and helping to shape 
the lives of Americans and improving them was always what motivated me to get involved in politics in the first place. For everyone else, you know, everybody has their own motivations for it. Some people are enamored with the power. Some people like the idea of, you know, being able to monetize that power and get rich off of it as a consultant. And that's fine. You know, everybody has their their reasons and motivations for it. And but mine was always to be how can how can I use the God-given talents I have to help improve people's lives? How can I help, you know, us reach that more perfect union? And um, so my journey through politics and the Republican machine uh, was 27 years. You know, it was a, a long time being involved in thinking, ideally thinking that Republican policies were the best way to go. And kind of, I have to admit, in hindsight, possibly ignoring some of the uglier elements of it all um, just because I was a bit naive to it. I'm from New Jersey, so I grew up in a very different racial dynamic. Um, I think that, you know, it's a melting pot where I'm from. I'm from right outside New York City, Bergen County, Paramus, New Jersey. So it's very ethnically diverse and my mom was in show business. So I grew up in the arts and, you know, New York City and all the benefits of New York and we could go back home to our grass in Jersey over the bridge, you know, so I had the benefit of, of, of all of that, that helped shape my worldview. And um, as, you know, through the years in working in, in uh, Republican politics and, and fighting for conservative policies, uh, working on Capitol Hill, was very exhilarating for, for me, the day-to-day -day of, of Capitol Hill and the inner workings of how laws are made and those political fights. It was, I looked forward to going to work every day for the seven years that I was on Capitol Hill. Um, but when Donald Trump came, came around, I mean, the Tea Party in 2010, I saw some, some issues with uh, some of the rhetoric and the way that the Tea Party approached solving problems. Um, I, I was not happy with some of that rhetoric. It was very, very vitriolic and a little bit more um, ethnocentric than I was comfortable with, but was just thinking, ah, you know, that's just kind of the fringe here. The fundamentals are the same. Well, we see that uh, what has happened since then, and then obviously culminating with the election, the nomination and election of Donald Trump, and then here we are now, where Trumpism uh, the malignancy of this Trumpism, this nationalist, populist, very, you know, ethnic grievance-centered um, way of, of approaching things has completely overtaken the party. And the more traditional tenets of Republicanism have just been thrown by the wayside, whether it's, you know, a strong national defense and, and, and a strong alliances with our, you know, the international world order that we've known since World War II, where America has been at the center of that, you know, NATO and Western style democracy and the importance of those alliances, that's out the window in Trumpism. Isol you know, economic isolationism, since when? Um, we're the party of free trade. What happened to that? That's out the window apparently now in Trumpism. Um, this idea of fiscal responsibility that's certainly out the window. Spending is through the roof in record ways, worse than under President Obama, where you know, I was on Capitol Hill when Republicans shut the government down over, over de deficits and debt. So that's out the window. And then just the sheer immorality and indecency of the Trump era um, has been very dismaying. And watching Republicans who I know know better acquiesce to someone that is so anathema to what everyone claimed they believed was really, really disappointing for me. And I thought I hung on for a little while there through the era of Trump thinking that there were more sensible people like myself that would be there to pick the pieces up after Trumpism had been repudiated and that the sane Republicans would be able to take the party back and build it back up again because the current form wasn't sustainable. Well, there are a lot of my friends like you, Rogers, that just said, I'm done. After, after Trump got nominated in 2016, they said, I'm out. After Charlottesville, po folks said, I'm out. Um, you know, after Helsinki in 2018 and, you know, kissing up to Putin and selling out our intelligence community to our enemies, they were like, we're out. Um, myself, my good friend, Michael Steele, former RNC chairman, and a few others were like, yeah, but if they run all the same folks out, then the party's just going to go to hell and who's going to be there to, to right the ship? 
So I held on. Um, but after November 3rd, when I saw that over 70 million people voted for four more years of the mess that we're in, and Donald Trump did what he said he was going to do, he telegraphed it, um, when, he said, when he started to question the integrity of the election and refusing to concede, and I watched Republicans back him up on it, enable this anti-democracy approach. I said, that's it. I'm done. I can no longer associate myself with a party that has completely abandoned all of its principles, every last one of them, even down to something as fundamental as protecting the integrity of our free and fair elections, which is so important to our constitutional republic moving forward. I, I, there, there is no more room for people like myself in the current form of the Republican Party. Party. The malignancy of Trumpism has officially taken over, and I finally walked away from it. Well, that's a very powerful statement. And I have to say, as a scholar of American politics, I never anticipated that a leader of the major party uh, would uh, so attack the um, integrity of American democracy. Um, and yet, the election produced some surprising results for the Republican Party. And I'm interested in getting your thoughts on those. Uh, uh, Joe Biden uh, did. Uh, decisively win the popular vote against Donald Trump, so that even though uh, Trump got over 73 million uh, votes yeah. now, uh, <laughs> Biden's at 79, and that's a decisive defeat. At the same time, this was otherwise a good election for Republicans. Uh, they uh, gained seats in the House uh, that there's a good chance they'll retain control of the Senate. Um, and uh, at the state and local levels, uh, Republicans won lots of victories. And uh, this was a high turnout election, which, you know, sometimes the argument is that's going to favor uh, Democrats. Uh, but apart from Donald Trump, uh, Republicans at all levels did surprisingly well. And I'm wondering how you interpret that. Um, uh, were those people voting for other Republicans, uh, were they voting for Trumpism, even as they voted against Donald Trump? Or uh, were they voting for uh, the kind of Republican Party and kind of Republican positions that you identified with? Or what do we make of it? So this has obviously been something that I've given a lot of thought to in the last two weeks as we've, uh, you know, we're, have examined what's happening since this is the campaign from hell that won't end. Um, you know, I was just so taken aback that on election night, I mean, I was just crestfallen as I saw the returns coming in. I mean, obviously I'm happy that, uh, that the big fish is out, right? Ding dong, the witch is dead, okay. But there, it was bittersweet for me because I looked at this, at the landscape and said, you've gotta be kidding me. That, all of these people still, despite everything that has happened, despite the position the country is in, despite the fact we have hundreds of thousands of, well, millions of people sick from a pandemic, 250,000 dead Americans, absolutely no leadership coming from the White House on this. It's turned into a death cult, in my opinion, at this point. Um, where people have, have weaponized the simple, simple act of wearing a mask to protect not only yourself, but your fellow man. That this has somehow now become some very perverted libertarian civil, you know, civil liberties issue that you're taking my freedom away from me by the government asking, simply asking you to be responsible and wear a mask to protect you and your fellow citizens from a global pandemic. These, it's, it's like the world turned upside down. And I, I looked at all of this and said, how is it that so many Americans don't give a damn about the fact that we have literally a pathological lying sociopath in the White House that has no regard for our democracy, who has thrown institutions, norms, and ideals, democratic institutions and ideals out the window, and they, have, they don't have a problem with this because of a tax cut or because they think, well, you know, he's, um, you know, been good for religious freedom, or it's been, a, it was a very self-centered 
I think, decision making. Do I think every one of the 70 plus million people who voted for Donald Trump are gung ho, you know, Trumpers with the flags and, you know, stopping traffic like idiots to prove a point, you know, at these MAGA rallies? No. There's a little bit, that, that number is too large and I'm uncomfortable with it. But what I have found and what I can no longer accept are the people who make excuses for Donald Trump and saying, well, you know, I don't agree with what he puts on Twitter. Yeah, you know, he's, he's, he's a bit unorthodox. He's not a politician, but I like the tax cuts. I'm sorry, but at this point, you cannot separate the two. People made a conscious choice that they were okay with the bigotry, the racism, the authoritarianism, the lying, the indecency, um, all of those things. They were okay with that. They were willing to tolerate that for a couple of policy wins. And that negative partisanship is so strong that it doesn't allow people to stand on principle and say, enough, no, we're not okay with that. And we're, but we're okay with the enablers. So we're gonna vote for them. Okay, yeah, we'll vote out Trump, but we'll keep our Republicans, even though they stood by him while he did all of these things, while he chipped away at our democratic institutions, we're all right with that. We'll give him a pass. I think that that's a dangerous precedent because it's telling me that there are, this, there are tens of millions of Americans that are okay with everything I just listed. That is unsustainable for our democracy, unsustainable, because there will be another Donald Trump who may be more polished, that's not quite as rough around the edges, that can manipulate so many people into such an illiberal form of governing. And that concerns me greatly. So. Um, that's one side of it. Now, the more, the less doomsday version would be that people just, they don't think that far. <laughs> you know, I don't think that far ahead. They just look at their, you know, kitchen table issues in their pockets right now. And they say, well, you know, I, I don't want taxes raised. I don't want more regulations. We don't want the oil and gas industry to, to go away. That's, you know, like in Texas and other places in the Midwest or, you know, Western Pennsylvania and Ohio, these are our livelihoods. And Donald Trump is telling us he's going to protect them. Um, you know, I don't want mobs of people coming into my neighborhoods, whether that's true or not. You know, we like law and order. We support our police. Um, we don't want these Green New Deals and the socialism creeping in, the government taking over our lives. So uh, I'm going to vote for the Republicans to balance this out. You know, I get it. I understand that. Um, but unfortunately, the only way that a party or a political you know, folks pay a price or change is if they lose power. So I was willing to put up with the policies that I don't agree with on the other side in order to cleanse the party of the Trumpists here who have just perverted so many things and have been so dangerous to our, just the democracy. This was really about just protecting democracy at this point. All those other things, the Supreme Court, tax cuts, regulations, none of that mattered if the democracy failed. So, but a lot of people don't look at it like that. And I think that's just, that that comes from a lack of civics, you know, education and emphasis on kind of what this country was founded on and why these things matter, why, you know, co-equal branches of government exist in the role of the executive. Like most people don't think about that. They just think very unilaterally or very one-dimensional about how does this affect me? And so um, that's a whole different discussion. That's a societal problem. So um, that's what I think happened. Particularly, that's why you saw a lot of ticket splitting like a place like Georgia or Arizona, um, you know, M Michigan, these places, they, uh, they decided that, you, you know, we don't like Trump, but we don't want to go full government, all Democrats, because the country's still very right of center, left of center. We're still a center left and right country. We're not, most people aren't comfortable with the, with the extremes on either end. And that was evident in the, uh, the congressional races and down ballot. Well, it is that uh, ticket splitting that I'm uh, wondering about because um, uh, clearly there were some who voted for Republicans but didn't vote for Trump. And um, I'm wondering your sense of whether they were nonetheless voting for Trump's version of the Republican Party or were they voting for uh, something closer to the version of the uh, Republican Party uh, with a lot of the positions you just listed that I think um, you've long agreed with. Um, uh, not all of them, but a number of them. And uh, uh, so uh, 
this is part of the question of the future of the Republican Party. Um, is it now simply the party of Trump or with Trump's defeat, uh, will uh, it revert on issues like free trade, say, uh, to something like uh, the older Republican position? Um, and let me add to that question, uh, does it make a difference uh, that the uh, demographics of the Republican Party are changing in some ways. Uh, uh, the uh, Republican delegation to the House will have uh, more than twice the number of Republican women uh, than it did prior to this election. Um, are these Republican women coming in all Trumpists, or do they change the outlook of the Republican Party back, or perhaps in a new direction? So, you know, I think that's regional. You know, if you look at uh, some of these, you know, some of the issues like <laughs> some of those women, two of them, um, are QAnon conspiracy theorist apologists, for goodness sakes. Um, I agree with them in the Trumpist camp, yes. Yes, yes they are firmly in the Trumpist camp. Um, the idea that you would have these wackadoodles that believe in this insane conspiracy theory as members of Congress being paid for by the taxpayer's dollar is alarming to me. Um, and the fact that you have one in Colorado and one in Georgia getting elected um, and, you know, down ballot, you see some of these Trumper, you know, Trumpist folks that are, that got elected um, is, is concerning. You, you are starting to see this power struggle already happening. Um, like in Texas, in Georgia, where the party is cannibalizing itself because you have the Trump apologists versus the more traditional Republicans. Now that Trump is out, where does the party go, right? And there's really no leadership that's making a clear distinction between, okay, you know, we, we did the Trump thing, he's out now, let's get back to what we, you know, what, we're, what we allegedly believe in. We're seeing that argument now because, because there wasn't a repudiation, they feel emboldened. So like what you're seeing in Georgia with this, um, you know, Republican on Republican crime happening, um, it's, uh, I, I think it remains to be seen how the, what happens moving forward. The fact that so many Republicans, you know, we all know that Mitch McConnell doesn't subscribe to Trumpism, but he is a political power broker and he's very good at it and understands the dynamics and what he needs to do to maintain power. So that's what this is all about. It's been a capitulation because they're afraid of losing power. And, but the danger of that is that they have emboldened these people who have subscribed to um, a, a version of, I don't even wanna call it Republican, because it's not, it's, it's, it's a hybrid of you know, nationalism and populism and um, you know, white ethnic grievance and um, some very ugly elements that have now kind of overtaken, it's why I call it the malignancy of Trumpism, that have overtaken the more traditional Republicanism. And I think that they've, they've lost control of it. They've given way too much latitude to Donald Trump and his, and his people. And I call it the tyranny of the minority. So this is, um, uh, this is gonna be a challenge. I'm very curious to see what Mitch McConnell and those folks do after the Georgia primary, because that's what this is all about right now. They're just placating Trump, um, letting him have his temper tantrum so that he stays engaged, so that they make sure they win those two seats in Georgia so they can maintain power in the Senate. That's all this is about. And, but it's at the expense of the integrity of our democracy is what makes this so craven and duplicitous. Instead of telling him to cut the shit, stop this, okay, enough. You are the former president of the United States in 64 days. The peaceful transition of power is part of what makes this American experiment so great, what makes our democracy unique, and you are ruining this. Cut it out. No, they're letting, they're enabling him. We've gone so far as to call them collaborators over at the Lincoln Project because that's what it feels like at this point, um, and which is why part of our mission was not only to defeat Trump, but Trumpism. It's not going away, and I think you're going to see this civil war within the Republican Party um, because Trump is not going away. And it's become such a cult of personality that it's difficult at this point to separate the two. So what happens? Is the Trumpism part of it going to spin off and become its own 
you know, third party and then the traditional Republicans come back? Or is this something that they're going to have to deal with for a generation to root it out? I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, we'll find out, but we're, we already see the civil war starting. And um, I, I'll be very curious to see how it happens. But all I know is that what they've done thus far is unacceptable. The obsequiousness in which they have uh, just bowed their knees to the altar of Trumpism at the expense of our democracy is a disgrace. And um, it's, it, I do not regret the decision that I made on November 4th, one iota. Every day that I see them continuing to do this and senators who know better continuing to enable this, this nonsense, um, it becomes even more liberating the decision that I made because it's it's a shame it's a shame but um, it was the right decision and this is why. Well, uh, I certainly understand your outrage and um, uh, I'm glad that there's uh, some sense of um, uh, liberation. Um, <laughs> at the same time, you have uh, all this insight from uh, being inside the Republican Party for so long, and so I want to hear. Uh, a bit more uh, your thoughts about um, how the uh, civil war in the party may go um, after, as you say, this rallying around to get the uh, two Georgia Senate seats uh, is passed. At this point, uh, people are not going to be attacking Donald Trump. Uh, but after January 20th, um, do you see signs of uh, older or newer uh, leaders in the Republican Party that might be willing to challenge Trump or at least aspects of Trumpism. Uh, we did see at the Republican convention, um, uh, African-American Republican leaders from South Carolina, from Virginia and Georgia, um, uh, whatever their views, and they were certainly supporting President Trump then, it's hard to imagine that they're going to put um, white grievance politics front and center in their appeals. Um, and so I wonder if in uh, the uh, post-2020 election and post-inauguration Republican Party, are there uh, uh, voices or at least perspectives that you think might rise in challenge uh, to the reign of Trumpism, or is his popularity with the base so strong uh, that nobody's going to mess with him? You know, I think in the immediate future, since he's not going away, um, that they will still continue to take the lead from what Trump decides to do. He basically has the party held hostage because 2022 is right around the corner, and there's no reason for them to switch course. It's been successful, as you mentioned early, on paper. They gain seats. They, they're running around claiming that the party is actually more diverse now than it has been, which is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> absurd. But on paper, it looks that way. And that's what they've conditioned themselves into believing. They've rationalized all of this. Um, and there's really no incentive for them to walk away from Trump. Now, if they, you know, the rumors that I hear from my folks on the inside is that, uh, you know, Trump, he, well, first of all, you have a very powerful ecosystem here with right wing media that allows this to foster, right? Um, foster and fester. And so, um, you know, if, if it's true that Trump is going to try and, and become, you know, a Trump TV type of of entity, whether it's Newsmax or OANN or whatever, and take down Fox, which I think is kind of funny given <laughs> the role that Fox has played in this. Um, that means that he still reaches millions and millions of his followers who are voters in primaries. So they still have to contend with the very powerful propaganda megaphone that Donald Trump has. Um, I don't see who's going to stand up now and what incentive they have, because clearly principles don't matter. Because if they did, they would have stood up to him by now. <laughs> you know, they, they would have they would have said enough after he stood next to Putin in Helsinki and took the word of our enemy over our intelligence community. You know, they would have said they would have done the right thing during the impeachment hearing, uh, hearings after they saw indisputable evidence that Donald Trump 
try to coerce a foreign power and withhold money to get them to indicate, you know, to, to investigate a, a political rival. Um, the, the Mueller report and what happened with Russia, we saw what happened. Did it rise to the level of collusion, which isn't a real legal term anyway, unless it's white collar crime? Um, no, they were, they were keystone cops that they couldn't get the conspiracy together, but there was plenty of colludy stuff going on that no one, if they had been Democrats doing that, no Republican ever would have put up with what Donald Trump did. It would have been considered treasonous. Um, there were so many things along the lines here and just the blatant disregard for life right? The party that's supposed to be so pro-life, but the blatant disregard for the quality of life during this COVID response would have been some impeachable with anybody else. I mean, the, the Woodward tapes, hearing Donald Trump admit that he knew how deadly this was and that it was transmissible through the air early on back in February, and yet he made the decisions he made to save his own political behind, even though it ended up ultimately losing the election for him, um, his failure of leadership, but to know that he just didn't give a damn about life. Your first job as the president of the United States is to protect this country. And he didn't. He abdicated that. And Republicans abdicated their oath of office by letting him get away with it. So, you know, they didn't stand up for principle on any of those things. So why would they stand up for principle now when politically it's been advantageous to them to continue down this road. And that's, that's the dilemma. Who's finally gonna stand up and say enough? I haven't seen anyone do it yet. Well, uh, that your answer probably predicts your answer to my uh, next question, but I'll go ahead anyway. The, um, uh, the lack of concern for life that you um, uh, speak of uh, uh, so powerfully is still going on in that there is failure to cooperate uh, with um, COVID relief efforts in the course of this transition. Um, what happens after the transition, um, assuming that uh, the Republicans do retain control of the Senate? Uh, the nation's problems are so severe. The pandemic, uh, the uh, severe economic hardships accompanying it for um, uh, many millions of Americans, um, and a whole range of longer term uh, problems of um, infrastructure, climate change, immigration, et cetera. Are there any of these issues where you can see Republicans in Congress after Trump is gone working with Democrats to come up with some kind of policies that will uh, help the country? Uh, or can we just expect stonewalling? I think we'll expect stonewalling on some things and action on others. Um, there Where will we get action? Yeah, I think we'll get action on a COVID relief bill. Um, that is something that impacts everybody um, in every district. No one is immune, no pun intended, from the impact of COVID-19. And the response to that, um, the fact, I mean, it's just a travesty that nothing has been done because of politics since um, the benefits have run out for a lot of folks and how many businesses and, and you know, unemployment benefits, all of the things that have just continued to hurt folks um, who have suffered because of this, that nothing has been done. And it was pure politics for that reason. Um, and just for Trump, he didn't give a shit either because cruelty is the point for him. Um, there has to be something done because I just don't see the constituents in these districts putting up with continuing to suffer and nothing being done in Washington. Um, you know, obviously for me as a small C conservative, the idea of another big government package and all of that coming in, I'm like, oh God, but you know, sometimes you got to put that aside. This is something that is an extenuating circumstance. And this is really where if, you know, only the government can scale a, um, a bailout like this to help people, um, so, you know, this was not by any fault of our, of our own, you know, what are you going to do? It's a pandemic. So, um, I think that you'll see some type of COVID relief package there, um, depending on how the Supreme Court rules on healthcare. I mean, it's kind of been now, a, a, you know, a white whale forever for the last 10 years, you know, Republicans, the whole repeal and replace, it's been great politically to keep people motivated because they hated Obamacare and this big, you know, government behemoth of a program, but it's been 10 years. So people have gotten used to it. 
and it's benefited folks. And the Republicans haven't come up with an alternative, which is absurd um, because they've been able to get by politically with just continuing to say no, 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 without an actual solution. Um, that's again, unsustainable, but I guess they can't come up with any solutions until we know how the Supreme Court rules on, on the case now about the individual mandate and severability and all that. Um, but there has to be some type of economic movement on things. And, um, you know, we joke about infrastructure week, but that's always an area where you can find something where people can benefit from it. You know, the unions can benefit, jobs are created, communities um, can be restored, particularly given how economically devastating COVID has been. Um, I think you're gonna see some room there for places to work. Um, but when it comes to some other bigger things, um, I don't, I, I'm not holding my breath for like any major immigration packages or anything like that because again, those are political carrots that Republicans like to use to motivate their base. So there's no incentive for them to work with Joe Biden on it. What about uh, criminal justice reform? Because we have seen a conservative movement against mass incarceration. Um, yeah. It helped President Trump uh, sign the First Step Act. Um, and Joe Biden is coming in saying that uh, he wants to address systemic racism, including in the criminal justice system. That can be inflammatory, but is it also something where there can be common ground on some reforms? Yes, and you know that's one of the few things that I credit the Trump administration for accomplishing. Um, you know, whatever his motives were for doing it, at least some of it got done and it helped benefit people's lives. Um, and you saw very far extremes come together on, on uh, criminal justice reform, which gave me hope that there is something that everyone can work on. And I think that um, with the George Floyd protests and what we saw this year um, has, I think, awakened some of white America that was naive to some of these systemic things that were going on or they thought they were over with. Um, so there may be some room, yes. I think criminal justice reform has potential. And when you looked at down ballot in a lot of places with the decriminalization of marijuana and you know, some harder drugs in some places, I don't agree with that. Right. But I think that um, you see that, the, that the, the citizenry is more open to um, the, the decriminalization of some of these smaller offenses and um, you know, opening up the economy to legalizing marijuana, uh, whether it's for medicinal purposes or recreational, there's a lot of debt in a lot of these states and they can make a lot of revenue from it. And um, same thing with criminal justice reform, that was partially what helped move that. You know, like in Texas, it was costing so much money for this mass incarceration that, that, that it was the fiscal conservatives that said, we have to figure out a more cost-effective way. That was their motivation. And you know, and the Democrats were looking at a more humane way of doing things, and that made for a good partnership because the benefit was how do we improve the system? So whatever the motivation is for it in the beginning that brings both people to the table to come up with a solution, well, I'm all for it as long as there's a solution. So that might be another area of guess that uh, we could see some further reform. So uh, there are some areas where we, um, uh, can hope to see a bit of progress. One last question from me before we uh, turn it over to the audience. Um, Joe Biden is trying very hard to set a tone uh, that he's genuinely going to uh, seek to be a unifier. He's genuinely going to be concerned about Trump voters and uh, their grievances. Um, he's going to try to be responsive to them. Um, is there a segment of the uh, Republican Party, Republican constituencies um, that uh, may respond um, to some degree warmly to these appeals, or is it going to be met with massive um, uh, cynicism and rejection? Uh, I think that there's a segment of the Republican Party that uh, would welcome it. People are just exhausted. These last four years have been five years, if you consider when he came down the escalator. So the last five years have been exhausting. And I think that there's a segment of the party that would welcome a, a bit of normalcy um, and some just, you know, not w waking up every day to what kind of crazy Twitter storm is happening and, you know, what corrupt, uh, you know, lackey flunky that Donald Trump is working for him did this with this Russian and, you know, this bank and who owes who this. And I mean, 
I just think that there is a, a segment that's just ready to go back and have our boring arguments over the merits of privatization of social security and um, tax cuts. <laughs> so yeah, I think that there, there, there is, um, but you're always going to have a solid, you know, 30, 40% um, who are uninterested in that. And they are fully ensconced in the tribalism, fully ensconced in the us versus them, you know, you're my political enemy. And um, that concerns me because that number is way too high in my opinion. Well, thank you uh, for all those answers. And now I'll turn it over to Katie. Great, thank you both. This is, um, we have a lot of questions coming in. So you've sparked lots of, um, lots of conversation. So let's keep it going. I wanna start with a question um, that sort of brings, you know, Rogers pushes you from the questioner seat over onto the other side of the table, but thinking about this question of populism and, and maybe connecting Rogers' most recent book, you know, there's one version I think of, you know, Tara, you've outlined the ways that uh, Trump taps into um, certain xenophobic nativist um, sentiments, but there's also a sense in which he taps into a real economic immiseration. Um, and I think we can read the 73 million votes as really a, just a resounding cry from people who are really in pain. Um, so, so Rogers, I'm wondering, what does this, you know, is this a sort of populist anti-establishment backlash that that we're seeing um, even round two, you know, can we say that after um, 2020, a second, a second, uh, you know, Trump ran on this platform in 2016, are we still seeing that now or um, should we interpret this in a different way? Certainly, I think that a lot of the both um, economic and cultural grievances, including racial anxieties and uh, religious, um, uh, feelings of resentment uh, that help fuel uh, Trump's appeal, uh, all that's still there. Um, and uh, like Tara, though, I do see some opportunities for the Biden administration uh, to uh, get sufficient Republican support to try to address some of those grievances. They clearly have to start with COVID, um, as Tara rightly argued. Um, and then there are economic hardships that need to be addressed. Uh, one thing that I've felt uh, for years um, had great potential to respond to some of the sources of populism would be uh, the kind of big infrastructure projects that we never seem to get. Um, uh, you know, I agree with Tara that we should be able to come together an agreement on some of these projects precisely because they would create uh, jobs in uh, the deindustrialized sections of the uh, country. Uh, they would create jobs at a variety of skill levels. And as they did, they would lessen uh, the sense of competition with immigrants. And um, uh, they might make those issues not go away, but be less incendiary. But I have been... Um, uh, puzzled by just, uh, you know, I thought Donald Trump wanted to prove he was a builder, you know, but um, we didn't get, you know, infrastructure week became a joke. We didn't get any of those kinds of initiatives. Um, I do think that um, uh, Biden will come in and um, after dealing with the immediate crises, maybe with the help of the vaccines, um, uh, he should try uh, to get kinds of economic projects, infrastructure projects um, that might uh, reduce some of the sense of being uh, ignored and abandoned in economic terms of some of the Americans uh, uh, that vote for him. Uh, the cultural resentments are harder, uh, but um, I think there may be ways of addressing them too that will diminish that appeal. If they don't diminish it, it's gonna remain very forceful. That's my view. What does Tara think? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And the, the, I'm glad you brought infrastructure back up because in the beginning, I remember when, you know, everyone was still um, processing Donald Trump's win. <clears throat> and as we approached the inauguration before the American carnage speech, there was discussion of like, okay, where could Donald Trump start? What would be one of his first big initiatives? And we all thought, infrastructure this is an easy win you know there you have the coalition of um of the blue collar workers and union members right because trump broke the blue wall in w wisconsin and michigan 
Pennsylvania, that these union workers and the, like the Bernie supporters and the idea of the, the forgotten workers there in the, in the Rust Belt, union infrastructure helps, you know, boost these economic, um, economically deprived areas and everyone would be happy. Democrats in the union base would be happy. And then the Republicans, Trump voters that, you know, um, felt forgotten and left behind in this, in this global, globalized economy now, they'd have like, you know, shovel ready jobs. Remember that? And that indicated to me when that came and went that Donald Trump was completely uninterested in actually governing because that would have been a win-win for everyone. But that's not what it was about. Same thing when it came to inf um, immigration reform, there were deals on the table that could have happened that Trump sabotaged because it would have taken away the cultural grievance aspect of his entire political identity. So that was very revealing to me that this is what we were gonna be dealing with, that there was no interest in accomplishing anything substantive, that there was never gonna be an opportunity to work together to accomplish anything. It was all only going to be um, something that he could point to like tax cuts, right? Everybody likes those for Republicans, tax cuts are great, Cr criminal justice reform uh, so that we can you know, tell the black folks that we did something for them. And that's about it because there was no other major real legislative accomplishments that came out of four years of Donald Trump. When Republicans controlled all three branches, what did they accomplish? Tax cuts, that's it. So um, I don't think we're gonna see that same level of intransigence uh, moving forward without Donald Trump there to sabotage it because elected officials understand who, who you know, butters their bread here. If you don't produce for your constituents, at some point they're gonna throw you out. <laughs> so they've got to start accomplishing something. You cannot constantly be the party of no. So Tara, picking up on a piece of what you just um, brought up, we also got this question in the Q&A and I've seen quite a, a bit of speculation and conversation around the, the gains that Trump actually made among black and uh, Latino voters, um, according to exit polls. Um, which we could dispute probably till the ca till cows come home. Okay, good. I'm seeing some response already. Um, just, you know, sort of preliminary analysis in our city of Philadelphia um, in areas with over 40% African Americans, Latino and Latinos, Biden actually pulled a lower share of the vote um, than Clinton did in 2016. So without overstating this kind of a, you know, conclusion given, you know, real success with uh, Democrats among those, um, among those demographic groups, what do you think explains those gains, um, and what do we what do we make of uh, those those initial votes being attracted um, to Trump in 2020? So I have a couple theories here, and I don't think we can definitively um, de de determine what happened yet because, like I said, this campaign from hell won't end, and it's still happening. <laughs> um, and we also have to be very careful of exit polling at this point. Um, it was already unreliable. And then when you have such massive mail-in balloting like we did this time, you can't exit poll an envelope that was sent in the mail or dropped off. So um, <clears throat> I, I would, I, I'll be curious to see how we assess this as time goes on. They figure out how to um, get those numbers, but let's, for the sake of argument, assume that the exit polls are accurate. I think there's a couple of things. A, the Democrats have a problem because um, minority communities, particularly the Black community, has felt taken advantage of for a very long time. And the irony of this is that it was the Black community that put Joe Biden over, right? The, in South Carolina, if it weren't for that, Joe Biden would not be the nominee. The nominee. If it weren't for Black folks coming out in larger numbers this time than they did in 2016 in places like Milwaukee and Detroit and Philadelphia, um, Donald, I mean, Donald Trump would get reelected. You know, these places, it, it's not an accident that Donald Trump is attacking majority, minority um, voters for voting fraud and all of that. So the, the ethnic grievance thing is still going on, um, which I don't think enough people talk about. But the, the, you know, the disenfranchisement and voter suppression efforts that were going on, that was another thing, another aspect of the Republican Party that I found to be just too much to take at this point. Um, you know, going from the party of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to being a party of flat-out voter suppression um, is uh, problematic for me, too. 
But anyway, um, so some of the things I think the power of propaganda of constantly repeating lowest black unemployment, criminal justice reform, you know, funding restored for historically black colleges, that is a powerful tool. You learn early on that social repetition creates reality. And most people do not focus on the nuances of policy and politics the way we all do. The average American, they don't care about all that. They don't have time for it. They're living their lives. They have to work, pay their kids college and their rent and their car payments. They don't, they're not worrying about the nuances of these policies, um, but they hear the headlines. They have the news on or, or talk radio on and they hear this repeated over and over again. So people start to think, well, shit, okay. Donald Trump's a businessman and you know, we, we have the lowest black unemployment ever. And it, it, it sinks into the zeitgeist here. You know, the body politics starts to go, oh, okay. And then the Democrats really haven't changed their message any, um, which is, you know, as a conservative for years, I've been saying that democratic policies aren't working. Look at your, you know, look at, look at these policies for 40 years, 50 years, the war on poverty has been a failure. You know, these communities aren't any better. So let's try a different way. That was one of the things that attracted me to conservatism. Um, I referred to Jack Kemp earlier, ladders of opportunity. Like that was a very influential part of my conservative journey. Even George W. Bush, the compassionate conservatism approach to things, being more pragmatic, you know, an emphasis on wealth and ownership. These are all things that are, you know, that, that, um, that are attractive to minority communities. But unfortunately, the messenger is a racist. So it's like a weird, it's a very weird um, cognitive dissonance almost going on here where the draw of an economic incentive and the conditioning of this propaganda leading people to say, oh, I'm going to try something new or go with, well, th where the jobs are, he, you know, COVID wasn't his fault. Um, and then the Democrats, they have a problem and they need to figure out, figure that out. But that I can only, you know, help solve the problems of one party. I can't <laughs> solve the problems of the Democrats, but I can let my Democratic friends know that um, they have a reckoning within themselves as well, uh, as far as minority communities and what they're doing and their messaging there. Um, this election should be a huge wake up call for that. And just one other quick thing about some of the economic gains, I mean, some of the, the electoral gains with the Hispanic community, the Latinx community. In places like Texas, again, it was economic. Um, and some cultural, you know, South Florida and Cubans and those types of, of Hispanics have a different approach to, you know, the I hearing the words socialism and, you know, coming from Venezuela and Cuba and kind of the, you know, the um, reticence to, to those messages um, that resonated with them and Trump, they knew that they knew how to manipulate that message. And the, and the Biden campaign really didn't do a good job. The Democrats really kind of wrote Florida off, unfortunately. I mean, even Donna Shalala lost down there in Miami. Um, so they underestimated that. They also, in, in Texas, in places like that, in the interior there where the, the oil and gas industries are, it was economic. They don't want to hear they're going to ban fracking. That means losing thousands and thousands of jobs, good paying jobs for Hispanics in those, in those uh, districts there. And they don't want to hear that. They're like, well, you know, maybe he doesn't like Mexicans and he's going to build a wall, but he's going to keep our jobs in our town. You know, it's hard to argue with that. You know, they'd rather put up with the devil they know, but have money to feed their families and buy a house than um, vote for the guy who might be a nicer guy, but he's going to destroy our industry and our livelihood. Whether you agree with that or not, but that's how it was framed. So um, I think it was MSNBC somebody, or 60 Minutes, somebody did a, um, uh, a deep dive into this because it was fascinating. Nobody expected this in places like uh, Zapata County and down there in the border counties there in uh, Texas and Mex you know, with Mexico, looking at them almost going red, uh, majority Hispanic counties. And people were like, wait, what the hell happened here? And it was about economics. And also you have a large contingent of law enforcement there. So you have a lot of border patrol and local law enforcement and Frankly, Democrats did a really crappy job of pushing back on the defund the police nonsense. That, is, I'm telling you, if you're in marketing or um, advertising, political communications, this will be used as a case study of what not to do in messaging. It, it was an epic fail. And whether defund the police meant defund the police or not, doesn't matter. Perception is reality. 
And that almost cost Joe Biden the election. I'm telling you right now, because my Democratic friends have already been arguing amongst themselves about the damage that that messaging did and how they did not push back effectively enough about, uh, on it. And that narrative took hold. And you know, in politics, you never want your opponent to define you because it's much more difficult to explain your way out of it. If you're explaining, you're losing. And I think the Democrats did not do a great job on the defund the police stuff. So those are all things that I think contributed to some of the uh, some of that movement in surprising demographics, but it's not sustainable. Um, well, you well then very tantalizing end to that um, comment. No, but I think you've we uh, got this bonus bonus material here on the Democratic Party as well, and I think the discussion is high. Your 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 response here highlights important lines of both policy and also messaging. I wonder, Rogers, if you would like to, if you have anything you want to add or contest just or pick a, up on the uh, last point. Just a footnote. Um, I'm not sure uh, that um, uh, there's been any dramatic change in Black or even um, Latinx voters. I think um, uh, it's likely that there will still be um, overwhelming um, African-American votes for Democrats and uh, about roughly two thirds Latinx votes for uh, Democrats as well. It may have gone down some. However, I kind of hope uh, that Republicans do become convinced that they're making uh, significant inroads with these communities uh, because the phenomenon of vote suppression that Tara referred to, um, you know, it actually goes back to 1993 and the uh, uh, Motor Voter Bill, and then Republicans began uh, claiming that we would have fraud in elections, people voting who uh, didn't have, uh, weren't properly registered and so forth. And all that talk about fraud over the years both justified a variety of vote suppression laws and primed a lot of the electorate to believe uh, the fraud charges that we're hearing right now. And a lot of those laws were driven by the belief uh, that uh, uh, Black and Latinx voters are going to vote uh, Democratic. Uh, maybe if some Republicans believe that they can actually uh, make inroads into these voters, maybe some of the pressure for vote suppression uh, will be relaxed, and that would be good for American democracy. Unfortunately, I'm not even further back than that, Rogers, and you know, you know this that. The whole voter suppression thing and Republicans, you know, I mean, the the idea of the Southern strategy uh, with Lee Atwater and Nixon and the law and order messages, which Donald Trump resurrected, dusted that off and um, almost <laughs> used that playbook word for word. Um, and then the idea of, you know, Republicans who were under a consent decree for 40 years after 1980 and some of the shenanigans are in 81, the shenanigans in my home state of New Jersey and some of the voter suppression efforts that they did there with, you know, intimidating minorities at, at, uh, at the polls and having off-duty police officers there with insignias making it look official like they were, you know, um, you know, using tactics from the Jim Crow South, for goodness sakes, to deter votes. The whole thing was with, you know, mailing, you know, cards and registration telling people, you know, their signatures were wrong and don't vote here. I mean, the Republican Party, unfortunately, has been doing this for a long time. And when that consent decree was lifted in 2018, um, it gave them license to go back and pull these shenanigans again, especially when you have someone who's a dirty trickster like Donald Trump who doesn't give a damn about ethics. Uh, they look to, and you know, Let's, how can we do this again? Because the less people who vote um, is better for us in their mind, um, which is just, again, another thing that is completely against what the party of Lincoln was supposed to represent. And um, I just think that they, if they think that now they can get minority votes, yeah, maybe they'll cut the shenanigans out, but we're only talking about a few percentage points here to your point. Right. You know, we're going from what, you know, six or 8% to 10? <laughs> that's still abysmal, you know, black voters are still overwhelmingly voting for Democrats. Um, and after 2012, when the Republicans were still sane, um, they did the, the, the famous autopsy report, you know, why did Mitt Romney lose to Barack Obama? And it was clear that there had to be better, more broad appeals to minority voters to expand the Republican base, or it would not, it would remain a minority party. Um, not minority like that, minority in numbers, because the demographics of the country are changing. And soon, 
um, Hispanics will be the majority minority here, uh, overtaking Black Americans, and or I think they have that already. But it's uh, it's just the demographics are not sustainable. So, but the Republicans threw that book out <laughs> clearly in 2016, and um, I don't know that what they did in 2020 is necessarily what will keep it, um, what will help continue to expand the party. Uh, they have to get rid of the, the ethnic grievance part of it because um, otherwise it will go the way of the Whigs because it will catch up with them. Great, well, transitioning a little bit, um, we also wanted to, we've gotten a couple of questions about, uh, Tara, uh, your work with the Lincoln Project um, and reflecting back, uh, we got a question, what, what you know, component of the outcome of the election should Lincoln Project take credit for? What was their impact? And uh, will Lincoln Project continue to be active? Is it, are, are you planning to be active in the Georgia runoff, for example? Are there other policy objectives now that the, the main task of defeating Trump, at least for this round, has been accomplished? What's next for the Lincoln Project? Yeah, so this is not the first time I've been asked this question. Um, and the short answer is the Lincoln Project is not going away. Um, it was clear that the mission was to defeat Trump, but Trumpism was also part of that. And after seeing that Trumpism was not repudiated, it became clear to us that the work of the Lincoln Project is um, still needed. So yes, we have, we're not as much of a, of a policy focused organization as we are a pro-democracy organization. Um, and we're kind of there to be the sentinels in the watchtower to, um, as Bill Buckley used to say, could the conservative role was to yell stop athwart history when no one else would. And that has kind of become our role at this point. Um, many of us have stepped away from our official Republican Party affiliation and made the decision that we need to be a pro-democracy movement that holds people accountable and we will continue to target enablers of Trumpism because we see Trumpism as an existential threat to our constitutional republic. So yes, Lincoln Project will be around. Um, 2022 is just around the corner. I know nobody wants to hear that because we're like, you know, we just want to take a breather from campaigns. But um, blame our founding fathers. Every two years we have congressional races. And so um, there are still people who were part of this cabal that will be up for re-election in 2022 that we will um, target for um, helping to get us into this mess. And as far as the Georgia runoff, yes, we've already begun um, our involvement there. And um, that's in line with uh, our, our goal of repudiating Trumpism, because we think that Mitch McConnell should not maintain control of the Senate based on his behavior. Uh, so it's less policy focused. I mean, I don't agree with um, many uh, Democratic policy positions, but like I said earlier, those are secondary to reinforcing the foundations of our democratic institutions. And so far, Republicans have demonstrated they're not capable of uh, defending them. So yes, we're still here. We are here to stay for the long haul. I wanna, Rogers, if you have anything to add, but I'm interested, you know, kind of pushing even a little more on this reflections from this election we've just passed, how are, how will these next steps and these next races look different than the approach that was um, taken. I asked you this question, I think a version of it, and the last event you did um, at Penn earlier this fall, is there going to be a focus on sort of base building? Um, is, that, is that going to sort of come into the view or thinking about targeting? We got a, a good question here also. Is there anything that could happen that would alienate um, Trump's base from him? So thinking about this, this sort of base question, um, so I'll give you a second on that. Before Rogers answers that, I didn't answer what impact Lincoln Project had on this uh, election. And I can answer that very quickly in a lesson. Right. Um, so we made decisions to target very specific areas. Um, we didn't really play too much in Florida, places like that. But where we did, um, Arizona, Wisconsin, Philadelphia, uh, Georgia, 
Um, we were very early on, we focused on some Senate races, um, not as successful with the Susan uh, Collins race in Maine, but we were successful in places like Colorado with Cory Gardner and Arizona with um, Martha McSally. So, um, and also in Arizona, we invested a lot and we saw movement there <clears throat> where you saw one in 10 Republicans voting for Joe Biden. And Steve Bannon, his rule, Steve Bannon, um, who should be in jail, uh, but he said that if 4% of Republicans moved, then Donald Trump would lose. And so we, we saw movement above that in places like uh, Arizona in particular, um, and, and in Wisconsin, and in Philadelphia, and in Georgia, in Atlanta, we invested a lot in um, a minority outreach and, and get out the vote efforts there as well to help move some votes. So those were specific areas where we know for sure that we had, I think something out of the 85 counties that we um, were involved in, we saw movement in 80 of them. So, and there's an after action report coming out. I think they're still developing it. That'll be on our website where people can see specifically more than what I just explained, where Lincoln Project had an impact. We call it the Lincoln Project effect. So go ahead. Well, uh, uh, since I left uh, the Republican Party in 1970, when those vote suppression efforts that Tara was referring to were uh, just getting started, I don't know much about uh, the internal dynamics of the um, uh, Republican base these days, and I defer to uh, Tara on those uh, topics. But I will mention a couple of things uh, that I uh, think we should pay attention to. Um, uh, to be honest, I expect Donald Trump will dominate the uh, Republican Party for the next four years because I think uh, uh, he may file to run for president the day after he leaves office and uh, that that's going to uh, take up all the oxygen. Uh, that's my worry. But um, uh, there are a couple of other scenarios um, uh, that are related to the work of the Lincoln Project. Uh, the first uh, that isn't related is that um, uh, Trump might actually uh, succumb uh, to a wave of lawsuits and financial difficulties that will um, uh, discredit him some over time with at least a portion of his base. He may get so caught up in a sea of troubles that he becomes a less formidable figure. Um, uh, I hope so. Um, and the other thing is uh, that um, uh, politicians being what they are, there are going to be people who are going to aspire to power within the Republican Party um, at the expense of um, the Trump family. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope the Lincoln uh, Project and others are um, identifying uh, Republican candidates uh, who are not going to embrace the worst features of uh, uh, Trumpism. You know, um, I disagree with Tim Scott on many issues, but I don't think he's going to advance the cause of white supremacy or white nationalism. Um, and there are a variety of other figures. Um, I hope uh, that um, forces within the Republican Party uh, will be working to support those kinds of candidates uh, because um, uh, I haven't been a Republican for a long time and I never will be again, but I would very much like to see it a party uh, that um, while having differences on policies is fundamentally committed to American democracy. You and me both. <laughs> we need two healthy parties in this country you know, for, for all this to work. I mean, some people would say, no, we need a third party. And well, maybe, I don't know, given the way our structure is, I don't see um, a third party necessarily being successful given ballot access. A lot of structural things would have to change for thir a third party to be successful. But um, yeah, I mean, of course, I would love to see a healthy Republican Party. It's why I stayed for so long, despite all of the things, the, hor the you know horrific things I saw happen under Donald Trump. I was still holding on hope. But um, I agree with Rogers that Trump is going to dominate this thing as long as he's breathing and not in jail. Um, he's, he's, he will be omnipresent. And, um, you know, whether it's from the purchase of a TV media empire or, um, you know, his kids out there running around still doing things. I mean, I've heard from sources that they're looking at uh, Don Jr. and Kimberly Guilfoyle possibly taking over the RNC. God help us. Um, you know, or Corey Lewandowski, Trump loyalists being installed in party positions means that Trumpism isn't going anywhere. So 
you know, like I said, it goes back to that civil war um, within the Republican Party that they're going to have to figure out how to navigate this. And I'm sure Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley and Cotton and those guys that are Ben Sass and those people who are eyeing 2024, they want to run again. They're not going to be happy about that. They, they want Trump to get out of the way so they can fulfill their own ambitions. And if he doesn't um, and continues the grift, as long as he has something to, continue, to keep ginning up his base and making money off of it, he's going to do it because it's all about self-preservation for him. He does not care about the future of the Republican Party. It's about him and him only and the grift, which we see happening right now with the recounts and these specious legal lawsuits and things. They've raised tens of millions of dollars in this, and these people continue to be duped by it and send their money, and it's really to pay off campaign debt or to pay Rudy Giuliani $20,000 a day to fail miserably in court, um, but people are still, you know, they're still, they're still buying into it and the victim mentality, even if he does get convicted, right? The state of New York and SDNY there, I mean, there is a cornucopia of corruption that they could pick from to prosecute. Um, but Trump will still claim that he's the victim and it's the deep state and they've always been after him. And there's a large portion of his base that will still stand by him. He can literally shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and they will make excuses for him. He's, you know, 250,000 Americans are dead on his watch and they're still making excuses for him. So uh, there's no hope for that group. <laughs> so I think that that ties in very well to another question that we got. And so it sounds like both of your answers is, you know, this base isn't um, going anywhere for a while. Um, and if Roger's prediction is correct, that we're going to see um, um, some confirmation of a, a 2024 bid from Trump after um, after he leaves office, then, then we can expect that. But there is a question here, what will it take for the Republican Party to return some sense of normalcy, normalcy in quotes, um, especially given the number of Republican leaders who are stuck between this rock and the hard place of going against Trump and risking their own reelection? So I think you've, you've each touched on this in different pieces of your answers so far, but if you have any additional thoughts to add on that question. They have to lose. When you are a single seeker of reelection, right? It's what you learn in Politics 101, that elected officials are single seekers of reelection because without their power, without being elected, they have no power. And it becomes the age old debate over whether you are a trustee or a delegate of the people and how much you feel you answer to those folks versus, you know, that's the populism versus federalism arguments and all of these things that, um, have been lost because we've just been in this cacophony of chaos for so long. Um, but that's where really, really what it comes down to. That's just human nature. You don't change until you pay enough of a price, usually. So as long as Republicans keep winning like this, they have no incentive to change. They have to get their asses kicked <laughs> before they change, unfortunately. Or they have to get shot with an arrow of conscience and principle and then decide to do the right thing and take the risk to do it. We haven't seen that yet. So that's the short answer. They have to lose. They have to pay a price in order to change or something really serious, like a civil war to get people to wake up and choose sides. You know, God forbid that that was one of my fears of four more years of Donald Trump, to be honest, um, was that we were devolving. And we, I mean, there's still, a lot of elements of that that alarm me, um, but we were devolving so quickly into this that um, you know, with the with the white supremacist groups and the armed militias and you know, kidnapping plots of governors and good grief, um, you know, that uh, unless there's something major like that that happens societally, uh, people don't change. So I'm not holding my breath that someone will have a um, you know spark of conscience and principle and decide to stand up and say enough is enough. I'm, I hope that happens, but I'm not holding my breath because we haven't seen it so far. That's what I teach in my intro to American politics class too. So that's, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's so, it. See, Rogers, any watching. <laughs> see? Yeah. I, is I agree. <laughs> so. Anything, anything to add Rogers on? Well, I was about to say they have to lose as well. So <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, let's get another question, and I can't improve on that. 
Excellent. Great. Well, we're getting towards the end of our time here. And so sort of moving, you know, I think one of the things you've both spoken about that's interesting and compelling to me here is um, thinking about an infrastructure program as something that could um, bridge the divide, be a next step, be a win, be a way forward, um, potentially uh, for, for either or both parties. Kind of thinking about the next step, we did get a question, which I think Tara's alluded to her answer here, but is it time to put the GOP uh, behind us and create a rational centrist party that believes in social responsibility, um, democracy, and other American ideals? Now, previously you've said we need, uh, we need two strong, healthy parties. So um, I'm interested in both of your thoughts on, on that question. Rogers, I'll defer to you since I dominated the last one. Okay, well, I wanna pick up on your earlier comments. The, uh, uh, the two parties have created a structure of election laws that create enormous obstacles for a third party. And so that's just not the most likely uh, route to follow to bring about change. Um, since um, uh, the 1890s, we get changed by parties changing their internal character and not their names. We don't get third parties displacing other parties. Um, I do think uh, that there is a potential for a struggle within the Republican Party if they begin to see that Trumpism is a loser for them uh, that could lead that party uh, to become not quite what it was before Trump, but uh, something uh, that is better for American democracy uh, than what we have with Trump. Um, but I'll note that the party definitions are uh, part of uh, the um, uh, mutual relationships of the two parties. And there's going to be a struggle amongst Democrats, too, uh, where uh, progressives are going to be pushing uh, for uh, that party uh, to adopt a bolder agenda uh, than I think Biden will feel he can do right away. I think he's become attracted to a bolder agenda, but that um, circumstances are going to uh, make that uh, difficult. Um, and in some ways, if the Democrats become uh, uh, a more strongly left progressive party, uh, it creates some space uh, for more centrist Republicans. Um, and if the Trump version of Republicanism doesn't seem to have uh, such strong appeal and there is room in the middle, I can imagine centrist Republicans uh, taking control of the party and giving it a different identity uh, within a few years. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I agree. I mean, like I said before, the just the structure, the structural barriers to the third party uh, are too high, and um, we don't have um, you know a parliamentary system where you have you know coalitions and multiple parties like they do in Europe. That that's that we're never going to see that here. Um, but my concern, and it was interesting, right? The title of this is the the party of Lincoln? Question mark. You know, I think back to things that Lincoln was concerned about back in his day, um, and we're facing those same issues now. You know, he worried about the uh, mobocratic spirit that could take over by the masses. Um, you know, that mob mentality. At the time, it was over slavery and those things, and um, and but yet. You know, and it, and the and the um, attacking of people who have di who had different opinions and who had different you know different religious beliefs and Lincoln was very concerned about that the mob taking over and that's basically populism. Um, and if the Republican Party continues to cater to that, um, you know, those things that Tr Lincoln worried about ultimately led to a civil war. So I hope that the that the the um, more sensible heads in the Republican Party finally, at some point, wake up and you know get some testicular fortitude and say enough is enough. If they see our culture and our society devolving into what we've been seeing so far, this is an unsustainable path. And you know we've talked a lot about the policies and things that are keeping people in the Republican Party. That you know after Trump is gone, will they kind of just want to forget that and say, oh, let's get back to our traditional things. I don't see how they're able to do that. 
And if they put their heads in the sand and do not address the cultural rot that is happening, um, it will eat away at the at the Republican Party to the point where it could go the way of the Whigs or something more drastic happens. And I'm not usually a doomsday scenario person, but I've been shocked, shocked at how vitriolic and irrational and um, susceptible to authoritarian concepts and tactics so many Americans have become. People I've known, personal relationships, people in the church, um, people who you think that you knew who have turned into these rabid, irrational, very nasty people that have exhibited misogyny, racism, bigotry, xenophobia, things that you thought like, what, who is this person? It felt like invasion of the body snatchers, but Trumpism has elicited these things, pulled them out from dark, deep, deep, dark places in our society and made them mainstream. So what are we going to do to address this? Because this is a, a problem that doesn't just go away on January 1st, uh, January 20th at 1201 when Trump leaves. These problems still exist. So I think there's a huge cultural reckoning that's going to have to take place. I mean, you know, it, it was Lincoln who basically said, if destruction is to be our lot, we will be the authors and the finishers, right? So it's gonna, it's gonna be, within um, you know our own culture and society here to decide whether we are a house divided against itself or not and that's a much bigger esoteric problem that we will not solve tonight <laughs> certainly not in the next two minutes but oh. i think it's a, i think it's a good uh, a good note to end our conversation on unless there's something burning that either of you um wants to say well, I will, I will say this, because I don't want to end on a doomsday note. Um, I, I think that the last few years have been very revealing. And one of the upsides is that, yes, it has unearthed some very ugly things. But look at the voter participation that we saw. Record numbers of people got off their asses and decided that democracy mattered and went out and exercised their right to vote. That's always a good thing. And people who were apolitical before or who were apathetic and weren't paying attention before are paying attention now. And I think that that is contagious and that's great because Thomas Jefferson was very adamant about having an informed citizenry, right? That's why he was so, um, you know, hell-bent on making sure that we had protections for the free press and newspapers, even though he soured on them a little bit and then came back to it. But, but the idea was that you know, the, the free press was supposed to be the arbiter of information to help keep the citizenry informed because otherwise you're susceptible to tyranny. We need to make sure now that we keep up this heightened level of, of engagement and help massage that for the Americans who may not have been interested in, before, in this before, but recognize that our that our democracy is fragile and that we are ultimately responsible for the government and the type of, of constitutional republic that we have. These elected officials work for us. So we need to build on that and continue to foster this engagement and make sure that um, we continue to speak out and that people are never bullied into silence because then that's how the other side wins. So. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to people continuing to be engaged. We continue to um, build this upon this, this, this great city on a hill and, and make it a more perfect union because we're not there yet. But that only happens with citizen engagement and being informed. So um, this is gonna be an interesting next couple of years and we'll see which direction we go in, but never ever be deterred or bullied into silence because when the righteous anger of the American people takes over, ultimately, um, you know, light overtakes darkness. And I think that's what we saw in this, this last election. Well, I wanna say thank you uh, so much to both, both of you, um, Tara and Rogers for being here and, and leading this really um, stimulating uh, discussion. You can sort of see the number of people that uh, sometimes trail off to events to go have dinner or get on with their evening. We didn't have a lot of that tonight. Uh, people really, I think were enjoying the conversation. I certainly did. So thank you both. Um, thanks again to the Andrea Mitchell Center for hosting the event and to BGAPSA um, for, for co-sponsoring. And we'll see you in a, a Zoom room soon.
Thank you. Thank you, Rogers. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, you, Penn. Thank you, Tara. <laughs>